the hardest part of a monumental work is getting started. Or rather, it's getting started in the right way. Think of the great Gothic cathedrals, the one that took generations to build. I'm no architect, but I imagine the most critical part of a huge tall building is its foundations. Get that wrong and everything else is worthless. How disappointing would it be to get 20 years into building only for doubts to arise about the foundation? What are you going to do? Tear it down and start over from scratch? One of the most monumental projects in the history of mathematics was the Elements of Mathematics series by Nicholas Burbicki. If you're not familiar, Borbicki is not a single person, but the collective pseudonym of a group of mostly French mathematicians. The group formed in the early 1930s with the plan of writing a textbook on analysis, but their scope would eventually expand to covering huge swaths of modern mathematics. A couple decades into this project, there started to be questions about its foundations. Some friends and even members of Borbicki suggested they start their work all over, and base everything on category theory, a branch of mathematics that didn't even exist when Burbicky started. They didn't take the suggestion, leading to the exit of Alexander Grothendieck and perhaps contributing to the waning of the group's influence in the latter half of the 20th century. Now, the difference between a category theoretic foundation and Burbicky's set theoretic foundation can get into a lot of technical detail, but fundamentally it boils down to the question what is the elementary stuff of mathematics? What does a mathematical theory consist of? Hi everyone, my name is Jacob Newman, and this is a video I made to explain the ideas behind my PhD thesis. Check out the website for more videos, more resources, and to read the thesis itself. I make other videos here on YouTube about topics in math, logic, and computer science. Be sure to subscribe and let me know in the comments what kind of stuff you want to hear more about. Now back to the video. Going from elementary mathematics to fully abstract mathematics like category theory involves two steps of zooming out. The first step is the movement from talking about mathematical objects to talking about mathematical structures. In elementary mathematics, you're often concerned with the properties of individual numbers like 2 or e or pi. But as you get into calculus, and certainly as you move beyond calculus to things like linear algebra, abstract algebra, and analysis, it becomes less about individual numbers and more about how systems of numbers work. Likewise with vectors or matrices or functions, the properties of any individual object aren't the main point. It's how those properties exist and behave across the whole structure. Modern mathematics is organized around structures. There are all kinds of different structures that mathematicians are interested in, but they all take the same basic form, a set of stuff and then some data on that set. A group is a set along with a binary operation on that set, satisfying certain laws. A preorder is a set along with a less than or equal to relation between the elements of the set, satisfying certain laws. A topological space is a set of points, along with a topology, encoding which points are in the same neighborhood and which ones are separated from each other, and so on. A metric space is a set of points, along with a distance function, telling me how far apart any two points are from each other. A vector space is two sets, vectors and scalars, with the operation of adding two vectors, adding or multiplying two scalars, scaling a vector by a scalar, and so on. These are the kinds of structures mathematicians work with. These are also the kinds of things that Burbicky wanted to write about in their elements. And so if you want to write about different kinds of structures, and a structure is a set plus other data involving that set, then naturally the foundation of all this is going to be set theory. That is, you spell out what sets are and how they work, and then figure out how to encode all this other stuff, like binary operations and relations and topological structure and functions, etc., as operations involving sets. This can get pretty elaborate. For instance, encoding the real numbers as specialized sets takes place in several stages. You encode the natural numbers as sets using something like the von Neumann representation, and then the integers are equivalence classes of pairs of natural numbers, 
and the rationals are equivalence classes of pairs of integers, and then you encode the reals either as Dedekind cuts or as Cauchy sequences. And then if you're being fully precise, you got to go through the effort of defining addition and translating it across all these stages, and same with multiplication and the less than relation, and you got to prove a bunch of other properties and whatnot. But it can be done, and it has been done. This is mathematics with a set theoretic foundation. But remember I said there's another step of zooming out to be done here. When you work with, say, groups, then the groups become your individuals, your atoms. So we could zoom out and consider the universe of all groups. What a group theorist is doing is exploring this universe. What relationships there are between groups, what are the different classes of groups we can articulate, what are the different ways of combining groups to form new ones, etc. And likewise, there's a universe of preorders, a universe of topological spaces, a universe of vector spaces, and so on. This is what mathematicians do. They define a notion of structure and then explore the universe of those structures. But Borbicki made the following key observation. There's more to the essence of a mathematical theory than just the universe of structures. You also need to have a notion of when two given structures are the same. That is, the other essential ingredient of any mathematical theory is a notion of isomorphism. Here's a simple example. Consider the unit circle in the real plane, the set of all points x, y, such that x squared plus y squared is equal to 1. Compare this to the circle with radius 2. These two circles aren't literally the same, but are they the same? Well, it depends on your notion of structure. If we're considering these as topological spaces, then yes, they are the same topologically. They're homeomorphic that is, isomorphic as topological spaces. This is in line with the idea of topology as rubber geometry, where the spaces can be stretched and contorted without losing their essential character. Topologists care about what continuous paths and loops can be drawn, and where there are holes and empty cavities and such. In all those regards, these two spaces, and any of these other wacky loops, are all indistinguishable. On the other hand, as metric spaces, these are not the same. There is no isometry, no isomorphism of metric spaces between these, because any two points in the unit circle are distance at most one apart, whereas there are pairs of points in the larger circle whose distance from each other is two. So a distance preserving bijection between these is impossible. The point here is that every notion of structure must come equipped with a notion of isomorphism. Defining when two structures are isomorphic is part of the essence of the notion of structure. If you change your notion of isomorphism, then you change what you're studying. You can have different universes with the same structures, but with different notions of isomorphism. This is the situation that Borbicki recognized as they set on, out on their grand project. That mathematical theories are defined by a notion of structure and a notion of isomorphism between those structures. So now we get to the category theorists. Category theory is also based on the idea of viewing mathematical disciplines, like group theory or topology, as exploring their respective universe of structures. But for category theorists, it's not the isomorphisms that are fundamental, but homomorphisms. Homomorphisms are functions between structures which respect the structure in the appropriate way. If I have two groups, G and H, a group homomorphism from G to H is a function which respects the group operations. If I combine X and Y with the group operation of G and apply the function to the result, that's the same thing as applying the function to X and Y separately and then combining them with the group operation of H. A homomorphism of topological spaces is a continuous function, and so on. The key idea of category theory what I refer to in my thesis as the central dogma of category theory, is that any notion of structure comes equipped not just with a notion of sameness, isomorphism, but of transformation, homomorphism. Homomorphisms are more general than isomorphisms. If my universe of structures is equipped with a, an appropriate notion of homomorphism, then I can define the idea of isomorphism from it. Homomorphisms or just morphisms, as category theorists call them, have two key properties. One, I can compose two morphisms 
that line up in the right way. If there's a morphism from X to Y and one from Y to Z, then I can combine them to get a morphism from X to Z. The other property is that every structure has a special morphism from itself to itself called the identity morphism. For structures based on a set, like groups or topological spaces, this is just the identity function on that set, which sends each element to itself. So we can make the following definition. An isomorphism between structures X and Y is a morphism F from X to Y, such that there's another morphism G from Y to X, where we can compose F with G to get the identity morphism on X, and if we compose G with F, we get the identity morphism on Y. So, the category theorists noted, the reason every notion of structure comes equipped with a notion of isomorphism is because actually every notion of structure comes with a notion of homomorphism. And then you can use this definition to define isomorphism in terms of homomorphisms. This collection of data, a universe of structures with morphisms between them that compose and include the identity morphisms, that's what a category is, by the way. The Borbicky folks were not on board with this. Saunders McLean, one of the co-inventors of category theory, went to one of Borbicky's meetings in 1954 to try and convince them to embrace the category theoretic point of view. But this was unsuccessful. And indeed, Borbicky would never truly embrace category theory. The divide would deepen. The category theorists started getting more radical. They started to think that the Borbicky style of mathematics, specifically its foundation in set theory, was out of date. Levere's elementary theory of the category sets re-envisioned set theory entirely in terms of category theory. A set was no longer a collection of elements, it was merely an object of the category of sets, a point with no internal structure. The elements of a set were instead represented by the morphisms to it from the singleton set. And the singleton set wasn't defined as a set with a single element, it was specified by the universal mapping property of the terminal object. The Cartesian product of two sets was no longer defined as the set of all ordered pairs, it was defined as an object having the universal mapping property of the product, and so on. This saga doesn't have a very conclusive ending, at least not yet. The category theorists, most prominently Grothendieck, pressed Borbicky to start back at the beginning, this time basing everything on category theory. They did not. Indeed, the Borbicky Collective continues to publish volumes of the elements and has never made use of the tools of category theory. Category theory continued to develop as a field in its own right, and thanks to Grothendieck and Levere and many others, it has come to play a role in broad swaths of mathematics. But it didn't replace set theory as the foundation of all mathematics. So what more is there to say? Well, in the 21st century, researchers in the field of type theory have taken another look at this idea of isomorphism. Earlier, I said that two structures X and Y being isomorphic means that, for all intents and purposes, X and Y are the same. X is Y. This is certainly how mathematicians operate in their day-to-day -day work. If X and Y are homeomorphic topological spaces, like our two circles, then a topologist will use Y in place of X without giving it a second thought. A group theorist will do likewise with isomorphic groups. So isomorphism really means equality. Two isomorphic structures are equal to each other. Now this isn't literally true in a set theoretic foundation. The topological space of the unit circle and the topological space of the circle of radius 2 are literally different sets, so they are not equal. But what if we had a foundation of mathematics where isomorphic things actually were equal? Or rather, what if the meaning of x equals y for structures x and y is precisely that x and y are isomorphic? This is what's going on with the field of homotopy type theory. There, the meaning of x equals y for two structures x and y is that x is isomorphic to y. So the question I'm answering is this. If a quality of structures 
corresponds to isomorphism, then what relationship corresponds to homomorphism? The answer is some kind of directed equality. That is, equality with a direction. Usual equality is undirected or symmetric. If x equals y, then y equals x. Crucially, directed equality need not be symmetric. x could be directed equal to y, but y not directed equal to x. Because directed equality is supposed to correspond to homomorphisms, and there could be a homomorphism from x to y, but none from y to x. x equals y, i.e. x and y are isomorphic, says that x is y. But directed equality is more dynamic. x directed equals y could mean that x becomes y. There's a process that starts with x and ends with y. There's a lot to be explored about this idea. This thesis is the beginnings of a precise formal study of this relation of directed equality and an exploration of what directed equality means.